The subcommittee will come to order. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. Nearly 50 million seniors rely on the Medicare program for their health care, and that number may grow to 63 million Americans by 2020 and 81 million by 2030. Medicare's traditional benefit design mirrored the private insurance products, namely Blue Cross Blue Shield plans available in the mid-1960s. While the private insurance market has undergone significant changes in the last 50 years, Medicare's traditional benefit structure has remained fundamentally the same. Unlike most private insurance today, which has a single deductible for all medical services, traditional Medicare has separate deductibles and co-payments for Part A, hospital services, and Part B, physician and outpatient services. The program also charges separate co-payments for Part A and Part B services. Today, seniors face great uncertainty about what their out-of-pocket costs will be. Generally, Medicare requires a 20% co-payment, but without knowing the total cost of a doctor's visit, a hospitalization or a procedure or test, seniors don't know what that 20% means in dollars until after a service is delivered. With no cap on out-of-pocket spending, a beneficiary can incur and confusion uh, about the lack of coordination between Parts A and B, nine out of 10 Medicare beneficiaries purchase supplemental insurance. On April 11th, 2013, the subcommittee held a hearing entitled Strengthening Medicare for Seniors, Understanding the Challenges of Traditional Medicare's Benefit Design, at which MedPAC Chairman Glenn Hackbarth discussed ways to modernize and improve Medicare's traditional benefit design. As I said at that hearing, everything about our health care system has changed dramatically since 1965. Today's standards of care and the test, treatments, and drugs we have access to were not even dreamed of when the program was created. Our expectations have changed as well. Fifty years ago, insurance protected us from catastrophic hospital costs incurred as a result of diseases which were most likely fatal. With the medical breakthroughs we've experienced in the ensuing decades, many of those diseases have become chronic conditions, and we expect our insurance to help us manage them accordingly. <clears throat> Seniors deserve an insurance product that reflects the current health care system, not that of the last century. Today's hearing builds on MedPAC's recommendations by bringing in policy experts to further explore how we can make the program work better for our seniors. I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to their comments on some of the reforms we've discussed at the previ previous hearing, such as combining Parts A and B under a unified cost-sharing structure, instituting a cap on out-of-pocket spending to protect beneficiaries from the threat of medical bankruptcy, incentivizing high-value care and others. Thank you, and I yield the remainder of my time to Representative Burgess. I thank the Chairman for yielding. I thank you for having the hearing. I thank our witnesses for being here today. In its current form, Medicare has made some promises that uh, may be very difficult to keep in just a few short years. It shouldn't be a surprise since we expect a program designed in 1965 to adapt to the needs and usage patterns of beneficiaries in the 21st century. Enrollment in Medicare could reach well over 60 million people by 2020. In 2013, Medicare costs are estimated to be a little over 3.5% of GDP. That'll be almost 6% in 2035, so certainly a substantial increase. The primary reason for the increase is the demographic shift. There's more people in the program. Baby boomers leave the workforce and join the roles of retirees. We should undertake an open-minded review of the current benefit design in Medicare and ways to reform it in a way that reflects the needs and expectations of today's seniors. We almost also must adapt to the needs of future beneficiaries. So let's have that conversation about innovative payment and care programs. Let's empower patients and providers by promoting quality measures that are meaningful to consumers that they can understand. Let's offer incentives in the program to promote better organized, coordinated health care delivery and payment systems. Many of these are tenets guiding our discussions around replacing the sustainable growth rate formula, and that's a good thing. But we must move toward a system that allows all beneficiaries a choice between improved fee-for-service, Medicare Advantage, alternative payment models such as ACOs, bundling. 
Just as each provider should be able to flourish, we must allow patients a choice, a meaningful choice, in how they receive their care. I thank the chairman for the recognition. I'll yield back the time. Chair, thank the gentleman. Now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Cologne, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and, and thank you for holding this hearing today. Improving and strengthening Medicare so that the program can serve as a reliable resource for seniors and the disabled for years to come is critically important. We must continue to examine ways to keep the program solvent as the number of beneficiaries grows from an aging baby boomer population, and we have already made important progress in this area with the delivery system reforms and the Affordable Care Act. According to the annual Medicare Trustees Report, Medicare spending growth is down and is projected to continue to have slower growth than the overall economy for the next several years. And I am committed to exploring ways to continue moving in this direction and modernizing Medicare so that beneficiaries today and in the future receive the care they need in an efficient and affordable manner. Seniors and individuals with disabilities rely on Medicare to access needed health services. These individuals are some of the country's poorest and sickest. Medicare beneficiaries, half of whom have an annual income under $22,500, spend disproportionately more on health care than the general population. As we consider Medicare benefit redesign, we must protect and improve this population's access to quality, affordable health care. Now, reforms should provide greater predictability and security for beneficiaries. For years, my colleagues and I have explored the idea of establishing out-of-pocket limits to protect seniors and individuals with disabilities from catastrophic medical expenses. This is also an opportunity to improve the Medicare benefit design, making it less complicated. The fact that Part A and Part B have such divergent cost sharing and deductibles can seem arbitrary and confusing to beneficiaries. We should examine ways to move away from this model towards one that is more streamlined. Yet we must ensure that any changes that we make to restructure Medicare do not come at the expense of beneficiaries' health or financial security. Any reform, particularly proposals that include changes in beneficiary cost sharing, must take into consideration how the changes will impact a vulnerable beneficiary population. For example, while reducing utilization of unnecessary health services is a welcome change, Medicare beneficiaries are not always able to distinguish between unnecessary and necessary care. When faced with higher costs, some beneficiaries will simply reduce their use of services across the board. Older, sicker seniors in particular are more likely to be passive in their care decision making than the general population and rely on their providers to steer them towards recommended use. That is why we must continue to support comprehensive approaches that help move our health care system to a more value-based system, including provider payment models that support value over volume. And the Affordable Care Act laid the groundwork for this, and we must continue down that path. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about their ideas to improve Medicare's benefit structure and look forward to working with my colleagues towards a system that incentivizes high quality and high value care while building in protections for low income and vulnerable populations. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Sure. Chairman, I have um, three statements for the record that if I could submit. I ask unanimous consent to, con to uh, enter into the record a statement from the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, AFSCME, a second joint statement from the California Health Advocates Center for Medicare Advocacy and Medicare Rights Center, and lastly, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. We have more than one subcommittee going at the same time, so members will be in and out today. Apologize for that. This time, Chair recognized the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate your holding this hearing. The Medicare program has been critical to ensuring the health and financial security of seniors and disabled Americans since its inception. And while I know we agree there are a number of ways we can improve quality and efficiency in Medicare, we should also work on broader health care delivery system reform. I hope we can also agree that we must preserve the strengths of the program and its protections for the vulnerable population, uh, populations that depend on it. It is critical as we explore this topic that we are mindful of who the Medicare beneficiaries are. Two recent reports looking at the supplemental poverty measures, one by Kaiser Family Foundation and the other by the Economic Policy Institute, remind us of the financial vulnerability of seniors across the country. Nationally, ne nearly half of all seniors live with incomes below twice the poverty threshold. 
In my own home state of California, the number is 56 percent, with 20 percent, or one in five seniors, living in poverty. Any proposal to redesign Medicare that doesn't protect these vulnerable seniors or looks to achieve program savings by shifting costs to beneficiaries is not one that I can endorse. I'm glad to see that a key element of the models proposed by both Kaiser and MedPAC is that they are cost neutral to beneficiaries overall. At the same time, I understand there will inevitably be winners and losers within the Medicare population. I can't emphasize enough the critical importance of ensuring that the full impact, both economically and in health terms, is considered across the population of beneficiaries. In our health care system today, among both private and public payers, there's a lack of alignment between cost sharing and value. As Dr. Baker has indicated in some of her work, cost sharing is a blunt tool that doesn't help beneficiaries distinguish between high value and low value services. In the same way that the Affordable Care Act removed cost sharing for age appropriate preventive services, we know from the private market that reducing cost sharing for prescriptions and follow-up care for people with chronic medical problems improves adherence and health outcomes. There is a lot of interest in eliminating first dollar coverage as a strategy to reduce unnecessary utilization. Yet we know that in poor, sicker populations, like those in Medicare, this kind of cost sharing reduces both necessary and unnecessary care. Reducing necessary care and having patients defer outpatient care and end up in emergency departments or admitted to the hospital is not the outcome we're looking to achieve. More value-based benefit design must be tailored to the beneficiaries. For Medicare, that means building in incentives for high-value care and ensuring pro protections for low-income and other vulnerable members. In closing, I believe there are a number of ways to improve the benefit design in Medicare that are accountable to both beneficiaries and taxpayers. In the process, we must continue to protect our most vulnerable seniors. We must make sure that we are not using program redesign as a pretext for achieving program savings by shifting costs onto the beneficiaries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Um, that concludes our opening statements. We have one panel today on our panel. We have today Dr. Catherine Baker, Professor of Health Economics, Department of Health Policy and Management, Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Patricia Newman, Senior Vice President of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Mr. Thomas Miller, Resident Fellow, the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you all for coming today. You will. Uh, your, your written testimony will be entered into the record. You'll be given five minutes each to summarize your testimony. And at this point, we'll recognize Dr. Baker for her opening statement. Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, members of the committee, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to talk with you today about this crucial topic of improving Medicare's benefit design. And this offers the opportunity to not only improve the benefit that current enrollees receive, but ensure its fiscal stability for generations to come. So I wanted to spend a minute talking about balancing two competing factors. I'm an economist. I have two hands, and I always use them. Um, that's insurance and incentives. The fundamental goal of an insurance product is not only to get people access to needed care, but to protect them from financial ruin. Seniors shouldn't have to spend their life savings if they fall ill. Their children shouldn't fall into financial ruin to care for an elderly ailing parent. So it's vital that Medicare offer that kind of financial protection that any good insurance product should. But balanced against that are the incentives that any insurance product creates. When you subsidize care, people consume more of it. We have decades of research that shows that, even though it's not intuitive that people consume health care that way, when the price of health care goes down, people consume more, and some of that is really valuable care, but incrementally it gets less and less valuable to the point that it might even have negative value. So we need to balance those two competing interests in designing a smart insurance product. The question is, how does Medicare do on that balance? And I fear that the answer is, right now, not so well. 
It does not offer vital financial protection. Seniors without supplemental plans face potentially unlimited out-of-pocket costs, as you mentioned, and that's not a good insurance product for them. On the other hand, uh, if seniors get supplemental in co insurance coverage, they then go from having too little insurance to potentially too much, where their care is subsidized on a first dollar way that encourages care of potentially questionable value. We know that in any given year, about 15% of seniors, if they don't have supplemental coverage, face out-of-pocket expenses of more than $2,500. But over 10 years, more than half of enrollees in Medicare without supplemental and cover coverage would face more than $2,500 in expenses. The typical Social Security retiree's income is less than $20,000. So that's a huge amount of money for someone with Medicare. That's why 90% of them, as you noted, are likely to purchase that supplemental coverage. The challenge is that the extra care that the supplemental coverage creates really falls on the shoulders of the Medicare program. The supplemental coverage only pays for part of it. If an enrollee goes to the hospital one more time than is necessary for good care, that's not good for the enrollee who does not want to be in the hospital, but it's also bad for the Medicare program because the program is shouldering most of those costs. So an ideal system would provide beneficiaries with the kind of protection they needed through the Medicare program, and then they wouldn't need to purchase this supplemental coverage that raises the cost of the Medicare program and threatens its financial viability for future generations. So how do we improve the benefit design? As Representative Waxman noted, crude cost sharing can do as much harm as good. Nuanced cost sharing, I think, has the potential to improve the quality and value of care that seniors get while reducing unnecessary or low value care that burdens the current system. And that means that cost sharing for different services should be different. It should be value-based cost sharing where care that's of high value should come with little or no cost sharing at all. And cost sharing should be ratcheted up depending on how the value of care diminishes. A care that has very little health benefit for seniors should come with a substantial copayment. It's important to protect low-income seniors from financial risk exposure. Again, it's an insurance product. You can't expose people to financial ruin, but that cost sharing could be based on income as well. The last point I'd like to leave you with is that looking across silos would very much improve the balance between insurance and affordability for the Medicare program. And by that, I mean care consumed in one setting pharmaceuticals, doctor's office visits, has implications for care consumed in other settings, hospitalizations, emergency department visits. Patients need to uh, have the right incentives to consume care in the setting that produces the best health value for them. Providers need to think across silos. Physicians should be thinking, what are the downstream consequences for emergency department visits? And insurance products need to look across silos. If subsidizing a physician's office visit keeps a patient out of the emergency room, the insurer should be working in a system that encourages that because that's good for the patient and it's good for costs. So improving the program in this way would have far-ranging implications. It would improve the value for beneficiaries. It would improve the fiscal stability of the system. It also has the potential to improve the care consumed by all patients in the Medicare system and privately insured patients. There are spillover effects. If physicians and hospitals do a better job for our Medicare beneficiaries, all patients will benefit from that higher standard of care. Thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to answering your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Dr. Newman, you're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts mem and Ranking Member Pallone and distinguished subcommittee members. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this morning to talk about restructuring the Medicare benefit design. Medicare provides highly valued health insurance for more than 50 million elderly and disabled Americans, many of whom have significant medical needs and modest incomes. Four in 10 have three chronic conditions, one in four has a mental or cognitive impairment such as Alzheimer's disease, and half live on an income of less than $23,000. Medicare, as we've heard, has a very complex benefit design with multiple deductibles, variable coinsurance uh, per service, and no limit on out-of-pocket spending. To ease concerns about unpredictable and unaffordable medical bills, most have some form of supplemental insurance. Nonetheless, elderly and disabled people on Medicare tend to have relatively high out-of-pocket health care expenses. Health expenses, including premiums, consume three times the share of Medicare household budgets as it does for non-Medicare bu household budgets, 15% versus 5%.
Half of all Medicare beneficiaries with incomes below $20,000 spend at least 20 percent of their income on health-related expenses. The idea of simplifying Medicare benefits and strengthening protections for seniors with catastrophic expenses has been one that's been under discussion for years, for decades, and has emerged more recently in the context of deficit reduction discussions. Modifications to the Medicare benefit structure could be designed to achieve any number of goals. Reforms could be designed to generate Medicare savings, to streamline benefits, to add catastrophic protections, to maintain the overall value of the Medicare benefit package while making improvements. They could also be designed to add greater predictability for beneficiaries to make Medicare more affordable for people with limited incomes, to reduce the need for supplemental coverage, and to nudge beneficiaries toward high value services. But achieving all of these important goals at the same time is a very high bar. To understand the potential implications of such proposals for beneficiaries and program spending, the Kaiser Family Foundation with Actuarial Research Corporation examined an approach specified by the Congressional Bus Budget Office in 2011 that included a combined Part A and B deductible at $550, uniform coinsurance at 20 percent, and a new $5,500 cost sharing limit. This was not a Kaiser Family Foundation proposal, it was the CBO budget option. Um, that we analyzed. This option, if fully implemented in 2013, would be expected to reduce out-of-pocket spending for a small share of the pot Medicare population, generally those who are quite sick. But 71 percent would be expected to face higher costs than they would under the current benefit design in this year. Seniors in relatively good health without an inpatient stay would see their deductible more than triple from $147 under current law to $550 if it were the combined deductible. Yet 5 percent of beneficiaries would be expected to have lower costs than they would. Again, these are sick, sick, and sick beneficiaries, people who have inpatient stays, post-acute care, the people who would greatly benefit from a limit on out-of-pocket spending. And over a longer term, a, a larger share of the Medicare population would benefit from a limit on out-of-pocket spending. MedPAC and the Kaiser Family Foundation recently released an analysis that shows 32 percent of beneficiaries in traditional Medicare would have cost-sharing liabilities that reaches or exceed $5,000 over a 10-year period. Benefit redesign proposals can be modified to achieve different objectives, resulting in trade-offs for beneficiaries for program spending and for other payers. Lowering the cost-sharing limit, for example, from, say, $5,500 to $4,000 would help a larger share of the Medicare population, but also reduce the Medicare savings. The reverse would also be true. Raising cost sharing for specific services, such as home health care, would increase Medicare savings, but also shift costs onto seniors and increase the risk that at least some would go without necessary care. Strengthening financial protections for low-income beneficiaries would make the redesign more affordable for seniors with modest incomes but could also erode the Medicare savings unless costs, costs are offset in some fashion. An example of a benefit design that does introduce low-income protections was included in the Bipartisan Policy Center initiative that was released earlier this year. Some of the recent benefit design proposals also recommend restrictions on penalty on, and, or penalties for supplemental coverage, Medigap or employer-sponsored retiree health plans, adding restrictions to first-dollar Medigap coverage, would greatly increase Medicare savings, according to CBO, possibly because Medigap enrollees would use fewer <coughs> services when confronted with higher cost sharing. A premium surcharge would increase savings by raising revenues from seniors who choose to pay the fee on their Medigap or retiree plans, but also by reducing utilization among those who respond to the new fee by dropping their coverage, and presumably that would be more likely to be people with more modest incomes. In sum, Restructuring Medicare benefit design pre presents a really important opportunity to address longstanding concerns. However, simultaneously achieving the multiple goals of various benefit design proposals is a challenge. Protections for middle and low income seniors could be incorporated into a benefit design proposal, but may come at a cost and could be compromised if savings are a high priority. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your questions. Sure, th <clears throat> thanks, the gentlelady, and I recognize the Gentleman, Mr. Miller, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak this morning on redesign of Medicare's outdated benefit structure. 
Restructuring the splintered cost sharing requirements of the traditional Medicare fee for service program separate silos for part A and B, if not D, provides a potential policy reform tool that could achieve the twin goals of saving taxpayer dollars while improving the most essential risk protection benefits for elderly beneficiaries. By increasing Medicare enrollees' cost consciousness regarding more discretionary initial dollar health care choices, a coordinated set of changes in traditional Medicare's deductible and coinsurance provisions could help reduce current and future levels of Medicare spending. Some of those savings from increased cost sharing at the front end of Medicare coverage then could be used to provide better stop-loss protection against larger catastrophic risks, as well as to substantially limit, if not eliminate, the need and demand for supplemental insurance that imposes excess costs on basic Medicare coverage. However, these fiscal and risk protection benefits must compete with and can complement other policy considerations. They include improved integration of health care delivery, realigned incentives to improve value-based health care, more effective competition between traditional Medicare and private Medicare Advantage plans, and continued protection of the most vulnerable low-income beneficiaries. And this complex balancing act, hard enough in theory, must remain administratively feasible in practice. A number of cost-sharing reform proposals in recent years hit one or more of those target objectives to varying degrees. My written testimony suggests some different ways to clear, set clear policy priorities accommodate necessary exceptions, and still maneuver through the complexities of implementation and administration. To summarize, traditional Medicare remains a largely unmanaged fee-for-service program that needs to rely on increased but more coherent cost sharing as an important tool, though not the only one, to help control its excess costs. Hence, overcoming the political cross pressures that resist any such changes must be worth the trouble by producing significant net budget savings rather than a budget-neutral rearrangement of the chairs on the spending deck. The highest priority should be to protect all seniors against health-related financial risks that they cannot bear on their own. That is not equivalent to hiding from them as many health care costs as possible through third-party payments. Such stop-loss protection, predominant in private insurance plans for decades, is long overdue for traditional Medicare. But in this case, it should be income-related rather than set as the same dollar amount for every beneficiary. This major risk approach to Medicare cost-sharing should consider the alternative of relying more on a higher rate of coinsurance across a wider range of initial health spending and less on deductibles in lump sum amounts. This would extend the corridor of cost sensitivity and engage more Medicare beneficiaries in monitoring the real costs of their subsidized care, yet temper the full impact of cost-sharing in deciding whether to seek any care at all. Amounts of coinsurance-based cost sharing also reset automatically as health care costs rise and hopefully fall someday. The cleaner and less complicated way to deal with the distortions of supplemental insurance for traditional Medicare enrollees is to improve that program's basic risk protection directly and then set regulatory boundaries on what either traditional, on what either individual Medicap plans or employer-sponsored retiree plans can cover. We don't need another new tax on those plans piled on top of the existing debris of deadweight distortions throughout the tax code. Let's subsidize non-poor seniors less instead of taxing them more. Of course, the poorest seniors must continue to receive special protection against health care cost burdens. Supplemental Medicaid coverage for dual eligibles would remain in place. More attention should be paid to restructuring current Medicare savings programs for other low-income seniors in a better integrated manner, and in some cases supplementing them, particularly for those facing high-cost conditions. Evidence-based preventive health benefits also should be exempted from expanded cost sharing. Efforts to improve health information and navigational assistance for all beneficiaries, but particularly those with cognitive impairments, need much more attention and budgetary support. The particular parameters for restructured cost sharing suggested in my written testimony are merely suggestive starting points, but they can help lead us to a reformed Medicare program that relies more on income-related cost consciousness, enhances true insurance protection against catastrophic risks, and reduces the likelihood of rising premiums, steeper taxes, and hidden benefit cuts. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and we'll now begin questioning. I'll recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. <clears throat> First uh, series of questions are yes and no, and I'll ask all of you uh, these questions. So, Dr. Baker, start with you. Uh, is it fair to say that you all agree the traditional Medicare fee-for-service benefit design may be outdated 
and overly complex for beneficiaries? Yes or no? I agree. Dr. Newman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. All right. And second question, is it also fair to say that the program is in need of reform to ensure catastrophic protection for beneficiaries, increased incentives for beneficiaries to seek value-based providers and services, and streamline benefits to reflect a modernized benefit structure? Yes or no? Dr. Newman? Yes, depending on how it's done. <laughs> Mr. Miller? Yes, in general. All right. Is it also fair to say that reforms on such a topic have been discussed for decades by policy experts from both sides of the aisle and political spe spectrum? Yes or no? Yes? Yes. Dr. Yes. Newman? We have problems with political markets clearing on them. Yes. <laughs> All right. Finally, it, is it also fair to say that given a Medicare solvency crisis uh, approaches gradually but inevitably, pressure to restructure the program's traditional benefit design will only increase? Yes or no? Yes. Dr. Newman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. As the pressures increase, we have to think about how we want to respond to them. All right. Dr. Baker, given that today approximately 70 percent of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in the traditional fee-for-service benefit, with the remaining beneficiaries finding greater value in the Medicare Advantage program, wouldn't a modernization of the traditional benefit design ultimately help the majority of current Medicare beneficiaries navigate a very complex cost-sharing structure and effectively avoid the implications of catastrophic illness cost? Yes, I think modernizing the design would allow beneficiaries to consume the care that was right for them in the right setting and the right, uh, from the right provider. And that added flexibility could drive towards higher value care for all beneficiaries. I think they should have choices about these things. Mr. Miller, you want to comment on that? Cleaner, clearer signals are important. We may, in trying to adjust for everything, make the system even more complex. All right, uh, Dr. Baker, you note in your testimony that cost sharing should be modeled on a value-based framework whereby cost sharing is lowest for services that are most effective at improving health care outcomes. Could you please elaborate and explain from your experience in looking at private market options where cost sharing has worked most effectively? Let me give an example from the care of diabetic enrollees who have really high risk of downstream adverse cardiovascular events and getting them to adhere to their medications, getting them to uh, meet with their physician regularly can improve their health dramatically and reduce downstream costs. There are a lot of innovative ways you can try to get diabetics to be more adherent to best practices and in the absence of innovation in different types of interventions, we see remarkably low adherence rates to life-saving treatments that patients just have trouble on their own uh, enforcing. So uh, innovative cost structures where maybe patients even get subsidized to take their medications or where uh, they don't meet with a physician uh, all the time. They sometimes meet with a community care person who coordinates across different patients to provide support for them to take their medications. I think we've seen that the crude tools are insufficient, even for a population where there's effective care available and the downstream consequences are potentially catastrophic for their health. And we see that kind of innovation in the private sector, and it's very hard for the current Medicare fee-for-service structure to mimic that kind of innovation. Dr. Newman, you want to comment on that question? Um, no, I would I would agree with everything. Um, I think the challenge is uh, who de who determines what's high value and what's l low value, and that's really a, an, uh, a major issue in, in terms of figuring out who would make these determinations. An easy example to think about in terms of value might be generic versus brand for equivalent products. But when you get to the more complex questions involving medical care, these decisions are a little bit uh, trickier to resolve. So I think that's a particularly good example. I know that um, in the MedPAC recommendation, they talked about delegating this authority, I believe, to the secretary because they were not prepared to specify when they made their recommendation what exactly is high value and what is not. Mr. Miller? 
this is a perpetual struggle in trying to get the benefits of what we point to in private sector, private insurance innovation, and trying to do that through a comprehensive public program, which has a lot of difficulties in making those type of fine-tuned adjustments and, and being accountable for it. We've got a one-time shot to get the basic shell of a structure for be Medicare benefits better, uh, but I think we can't legislate every single particular in that regard. I'd suggest that although most of these proposals say, well, we'll just give the Secretary some discretion and it'll all work out, there'll be some rulemaking. You need to have some, some, some evidentiary boundaries as to exactly how far that's going to go. Most of the examples of value-based insurance design tend to be one-sided. Uh, we know how to add benefits which make everybody happy and feel better. We have a lot more problems in taking them away. So you could impose somewhat of a budget neutral neutrality constraint saying for everything you need to put on, if it's going to pay off, something else has to not pay off as well. And that's one way to get it a little more even-handed rather than a one-sided approach. The Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Newman, uh, many of the proposals for redesigning Medicare's benefit package attempt to balance program simplification through combined deductibles and more predictable out-of-pocket expenses with efforts to improve the program value and efficiency. Many of us would agree that there is a need to simplify the structure of Medicare benefits in, a, in ways that make it more understandable and user-friendly for beneficiaries and provide them with better protections by providing out-of-pocket spending caps like private insurance plans. Your analysis clearly show that while a small number of beneficiaries would benefit from their restructured design, a much larger number uh, would see increased out-of-pocket expenses. So can you talk about how with any of these plans there will be inevitably winners and losers? Well, there are 50 million people on Medicare and everybody has a different set of health care experiences and, and health care needs and uh, supplemental insurance, which varies across people. And when you change the benefit design, depending on what services people use in a given year, their out-of-pocket costs are going to differ than what they would have been under current law. So in the sort of the, the, the prototype policy that we looked at, uh, the high out-of-pocket expense, of course, protects the small share of people. The high out-of-pocket limit um, protects a very small share of the Medicare population with high spending. Um, that costs, when you add a benefit to Medicare, that increases Medicare spending. And part of that, uh, n the new costs are offset by the higher deductible that so many more people on Medicare will pay because 80 percent of people don't go to the hospital. So 80 percent of people don't incur an inpatient deductible. <coughs> So for the majority of people who don't go to the hospital, they would pay a higher deductible, and so they would see their deductibles increase if this were to be imposed, for example, this year. Okay. Now, how can we design a plan that's mindful of the financial insecurity of the large number of Medi Medicare beneficiaries and builds inadequate protections? Well, I think it's tricky if the, the goal is to produce savings. So in an environment where the, the overall objective is to produce Medicare savings, it could be quite challenging to build in protections and to lower cost-sharing risk for people with modest incomes. Um, to protect people with modest incomes, one might think about, for example, the Bipartisan Policy Center's initiative, which federalized cost-sharing assistance for people with incomes between 150, 100 and 150 percent of poverty. This is building on the Part D model for low-income subsidies. But adding protections also adds to costs. So to do this, one would need to find a way to offset those costs in some fashion. Okay. Dr. Baker, I know your research has looked a lot at value-based insurance design, and one of the points you make is that cost-sharing, as it currently is used in the insurance industry, is a blunt tool. It reduces health care spending, but in a way that doesn't differentiate between high and low-value care. It also doesn't take into account the diversity of the beneficiary population who, based on their financial and health status, are likely to respond differently. So unfortunately, the notion of creating incentives for beneficiaries to make better decisions is often looked at only through the narrow lens of increased cost sharing. Can you talk about ways other than increased cost sharing that benefits can be structured to encourage use of appropriate high value services and discourage the use of unnecessary services? And how important is it to ensure there are not barriers to high value care? I think you raise a really important point that uh, cost sharing on the patient side has some potential for harms, especially if it's uh, implemented for all patients in the same way. And on the patient side, 
the ideal cost sharing might depend not just on the service or the medication or the setting, but also on the particular patient. So a cholesterol lowering drug for a diabetic patient is higher value than that cholesterol lowering drug for a different patient. And it's very hard to write down a set of rules for specific procedures or specific medications and call them high value and others not when it really varies patient to patient. So it would have to be a much more flexible design on the patient side, which we've seen some experimentation with in the private sector, but we're nowhere near uh, achieving the possibilities. On the provider side, I think one could also approach promoting higher value care by um, making payments look across silos. And that means not paying more for care in one setting than another setting when the patient might be better off individually in the setting that's less well reimbursed. The reimbursement should really be neutral about where the patient gets the care based on, so the patient could choose based on what's best for that particular set of circumstances. There could also be payments on the provider side that bundled care across silos and over time. Those bundles have to be big to incorporate, you know, from the physician's office to the hospital to the post-acute care. There's a huge amount of variation in spending in post-acute care, and somebody has to be responsible for that in the provider system so that patients get high-value care after a hospitalization that not only improves their health but keeps them out of the hospital again. So I think we have to approach it both from the patient side, but as you note, from outside the patient side, from the provider side as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Lex Shellman, now recognized gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have you here. Um, a issue that's befuddled the national government probably since the inception of, of Medicare in 1965. Uh, those of us who have been around for a long time, I can't think of a time when I haven't talked about the uh, structural uh, deficiency and our promise to pay future generations based upon the formula that we have today. And so thanks for this. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of going to go to um, uh, my question is going to be first, if, if people can shop around for homeowners insurance and automobile insurance, do you think it's too much to ask for individuals to shop around for health insurance? Why don't we go left to right? Yeah. I think individuals should have choices among health insurance plans, and I think that that would foster <coughs> innovation in insurance design as well as competition on prices. But insurers should be experimenting with the best way to manage diabetic enrollees, for example, and then they, they should be able to attract more of them by providing higher value care. And Dr. Newman? Uh, I think people on Medicare should have choices, and um, people on Medicare, for example, do have the ability to shop within the Medicare Advantage program. I'm going to um, to, today. Um, I think as people get older and have more impairments and cognitive impairments, then the shopping process gets more difficult because it is, I think we've all experienced looking at health insurance and it is a fairly complicated it, it is, enterprise. But I, I guess the other issue too is if, um, and I, I can really understand the debate on seniors at a certain age, but it's those seniors at a certain age are still buying their automobile insurance and they're still paying their home insurance. Um, um, and there's a training process too. I mean, you can't expect uh, seniors today, a lot of seniors today who are on fee for service to automatically move into a competitive market model and shop around. I mean, I think that's really in essence way too much to ask, but it, we all get the drift from going. Mr. Uh, Miller. Uh, we can certainly improve the uh, shopping process for insurance, but we sometimes overinvest in it too much. You know, Kate was talking before about getting into broader bundles. What we really want to have is measures of outcomes for all of the players who are providing our care, and that goes beyond just the insurer you select. So what we need to think about is how seniors can shop more effectively for the team of care they're going to receive or the various folks they go to first further on down the stream, particularly in Medicare fee for service program where you're not buying as much of a orchestrated integrated product. So as much as we want to enhance the shopping experience with that front end uh, idea of what are my benefits, what are my cost sharing, we need to know what it actually, what's the value of that right. total experience. Yeah, this is a, um, even in the much maligned or supported uh, Obamacare um, uh, Accountable Care Act, the, the premise is getting people into markets, state exchanges where they can shop around. Um, and 
So this really is a segue to that o issue. If you can then move the public at large, either by their employer or the individual citizen, in essence, forcing them to shop around in an individual exchange, why, why isn't the segue then into future generations move these people then into a market-based system uh, of a health insurance providers for Medicare and Medicaid? And that, and that might even also address the payment disparities that you see from these two programs, which people, well, the most majority, would much rather pay the Medicare rate than, than they're going to receive on a Medicaid reimbursement, which really distorts this whole funding scheme. Does anyone disagree with that? Or anything to add? No, I, I think the making it easy for people is key, that competition doesn't work if people aren't able to evaluate the options in front of them and aren't able to move. And that is about making information transparent. And it's also about sort of smoothing pathways. We know that it is hard for people when they have, you know, so many different choices and the information is varied to and, make wise decisions. And, and let me just jump in because my time is short. But D Dr. Newman, you kind of mentioned it and you were kind of leading up. I was kind of building momentum here for this thing. Does Medicare Advantage strike this balance to some extent of of allowing people uh, choices in systems and a way to shop around uh, that could be, in essence, kind of rolled up uh, writ large, I think? Uh, you know, it could. People have the choice of traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans, and then if they choose Medicare Advantage plans, they can choose among them. Um, we don't really know very much, actually, about how people are choosing plans and whether they are choosing the best plans for them. We know in the Part D marketplace that people are actually not making choices in terms of which plan would um, reduce their cost the most. So we still are pretty early on in this experiment in terms of understanding how, how seniors behave in the marketplace. But D, and I'll end on this, but, but D, I, I don't know the recent or, uh, approval ratings or the like, but it's still well received. Oh, yeah. And, people, uh, people approval ratings are higher than any health care thing we've passed ever in this in this in this chamber yeah. so it's a very successful model i yield back my time chair thanks the gentleman and now recognize the uh, distinguished ranking member of the full committee mr dingle for five minutes for questions mr chairman i thank you for your courtesy and i thank you for holding this hearing today it's very important as most people know my dad was the originator of medicare and I was proud to co-sponsor the legislation and to preside over the House of Representatives during its passage. The program has endured as one of the most significant pieces of legislation in our nation's history and is of <coughs> enormous importance to our senior citizens and to a lot of other people. I recognize that it's time for a review on a continuing basis of this great program, but I, and I believe that we can do so uh, without limiting or decreasing benefits that are available to our seniors today as we look to see to it that it's conducted in the most efficient way from the standpoint of cost and other things. Now, the testimony today focuses on a number of proposals on how to reform Medicare. I want to focus my questions on the impact these programs and reforms would have on seniors. Uh, Dr. Newman, these questions are directed to you as spokesman for the Kaiser Health Foundation. I want to thank you and the other members of the panel for being here. Your assistance is much appreciated. Doctor, is it correct that nearly one in four of Medicare beneficiaries are only in fair or poor health? Yes, sir. Uh, doctor, is it also correct that 40 percent of Medicare beneficiaries live with three or more chronic conditions? Yes. Doctor, do more than half of Medicare beneficiaries live on incomes of less than $22,500 a year? Yes. Dr. Newman, does Medicare have a limit on out-of-pocket expenses for beneficiaries? No. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Newman, is it correct that Medicare beneficiaries with incomes below $20,000 per year spent something like 20% of their income on health-related expenses? Yes. Now, doctor, thank you. It's clear that we have many benef beneficiaries for Medicare who have serious health needs and very limited resources to pay for their care. Placing cost-sharing requirements on this population is going to have to be done 
very carefully it will have or it will have an appalling negative impact on their health and financial security. Now the Kaiser Family Foundation recently commissioned a study which has been discussed this morning on the impact of three reforms that have been proposed by many different groups. A unified co-payment for parts A and B, a 20% co-insurance for Medicare services, and a $5,000 annual limit on out-of-pocket spending. Um, Dr. Newman, did this study find that 71% of the beneficiaries would see an increase in out-of-pocket costs to them if this plan was implemented this year? Yes. Now, Doctor, uh, did this study also find that aggregate spending among Medicare beneficiaries would increase over $2 billion? Yes, sir. And, Doctor, I hope you understand I'm, I'm doing this so we can get an awful lot into the record as opposed to putting you in any kind of a difficult place. Uh, doctor, do you believe that these proposed reforms would also lead to increased costs for beneficiaries if not structured properly? Yes, I think there's a risk that that could happen. And I believe that you're suggesting that if we're to do this, it should be done with all the facts and with a great deal of care. That's correct. Now, I think we need to take a good hard look at the ways that Medicare can be reformed so that the program continue to provide s security for our future generations. However, we must ensure that such reforms are not simply shifting costs from the federal government to senior citizens who are incapable of properly meeting those demands. Medicare is a promise to our senior citizens, and we need to keep our word to them. I'm confident that we can improve the program while protecting access to care if we work carefully together in a bipartisan manner. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, recognizing me. I want to commend and thank our panel, especially you, Dr. Newman, and I hope that as we proceed forward, we will do so with exquisite care. We have a program of vital importance to our senior citizens, one which must be protected and one which with unwise tinkering can cause no end of problems. I also note that if properly done, it is a program which could continue to, particip uh, to persist in service of our people for a long time to the future and that the corrections are not disastrous if properly done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have yield back one second. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions. Hello, thank you all. I enjoyed your testimony and your um, uh, written testimony. Uh, Dr. Miller, I think I may end up quoting some of yours, but I won't quote it here. <laughs> it's there uh, for your use. Dr. Baker, I think you, it may have been your testimony where you hint at. Uh, indeed, it may not only be expensive to have overutilization of services, but also harmful to the patient's health. I see uh, both of you nodding your head. I agree with that totally. So let's be clear. When we speak about using services more widely, it's not only monetary, but most importantly, it is about making sure the patient's health is not harmed. Uh, yeah. I, I agree that not harming health is clearly first and foremost, and then there's also care that's of potentially zero benefit or very small benefit that's really expensive. Correct. Okay. So now, uh, one thing that you read about is the activated patient, the activated patient whose expenses are 8 to 21 percent lower than the person, and I gather maybe even be some empiric evidence that the activated patient is a healthier patient. Uh, just for those listening who may not know, an activated patient fully participates in her care both physically and both financially. Now, of any of y'all, and try and keep your answers brief, please, do any of you have specific suggestions or the things that you suggested, do you feel as if they would create the so-called activated patient, the one participating both in her health decisions as well as her financial decisions? For example, Dr. Miller, you speak, or Ms. Miller, you speak of um, oh, uh, value-based purchasing as, you, as do maybe all three of you. I don't really think of that as creating an activated patient. That's actually just saying we're going to pay for this and not pay for the that. The decisions are made before the patient's asked about it, and we're steering them in that particular direction. Now, we can do that in some areas. Certainly, the, the best evidence tends to be in the prescription drug area. That's largely accommodated through Part D already in Medicare. So I think we can move that mostly off the table. So by incentivizing patients to go to generics and allowing them to save money, you create an activated patient who's both looking at the cost, but also by doing so improving. Looking at the cost opens the door to thinking about the value. 
Cost is only the opening consideration, but if you haven't gotten someone's attention with the cost, they may not think about how that balances out against the qualitative trade-offs. Now, Mr. Miller, I liked your kind of testimony. If you went to a higher coinsurance, but you still had the same limit on out-of-pocket, you may achieve both, uh, maybe more upfront cost. But you're, you're trying to expose more patients across a wider range of decisions to thinking about now, have we effectively? Now, let me ask you this, and this is something I haven't completely worked through. So, but but so if I totally fumble, please forgive me. As some hospitals are purchasing physicians' practices, typically procedurally based, and they're beginning to bill out of Medicare Part A as opposed to Part B, effectively we're having what you're describing, in which the deductible for that Part A service is often greater than it would be for the equivalent Part B. We're seeing a downward trend in Medicare spending. I've tried to learn if, this attri oh. if that is attributable to this phenomena. That's more difficult than it seems like it should be. I've not yet been able to determine that. But it seems to me that we may be seeing examples of what you're describing, bringing that into Part A, increasing the upfront deductible and coinsurance cost, and yet there's been no decrease in health quality and there has been a decrease in spending. Any thoughts on that? Well, I wouldn't get into – I've not looked at that – Data compare. I mean, we've got a different type of thing going on where hospital outpatient because it's reimbursed more generously than, but that than, than other outpatient. That, that's the way we do that those types of shifts, more. Which, which is the problem of all these type of siloed payments. Other private parties will find ways to maneuver around. Well, I accept them, that them as a different thing. But just my general point that we have effectively increased the amount that's out of pocket for patients, but and we've actually seen a decrease in spending in the Medicare program in the Part B program. Right. Uh, any thoughts on that, or Dr. Baker or Dr. Newman? Well, I think you hit on uh, a key point that innovative insurance companies can drive patients to be more engaged in their own care. And that innovation could come in the form of cost sharing, or it could come in other ways that uh, insurers think of to get the patients engaged. And having them have that flexibility would open up a wider set what of What are some other examples of how they could be engaged besides cost sharing? Because clearly we need patient engagement. I think there's examples of um, getting patients to interact with a wider set of patients who have conditions like them, of getting text messages to remind them of things, of getting Now, uh, I've heard about that. Has, that. has that actually been shown in some sort of peer-reviewed, double-blind way that actually work? I think text messages do increase adherence to medications, that part of not taking your meds is not about the copay, because you already have the drugs, but taking them regularly requires, it's a, it's a skill, it's a habit, and there, have to be, there has to be skill building that if you don't have the right incentives, insurers don't engage and providers don't engage in patient So if you will, though, that's not the insurance product per se, but rather the administration or patient care aspect of it, correct? But if the insurers and the providers have the right incentives, then they can innovate in that dimension that benefits patients by getting them more engaged. And you need a system that incentivizes upstream for that to happen downstream. Got you. Thank you all. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your expert advice uh, provided to the committee. Uh, I, I want to start off by saying um, Thank goodness for Medicare. When you look back over uh, the past decades, what security that has brought to our families all across America. Our parents and grandparents now, we, we don't have to worry about uh, our older neighbors falling into to poverty because of their health issues. Uh, as they get older. so And now with the Affordable Care Act, Medicare is even stronger. We have already adopted very important reforms moving forward. The, benefit, the benefits for Medicare beneficiaries are better. Uh, the life of the trust fund has been extended. Uh, it's not great, though, and I worry because I see this this huge uh, population of the baby boomers now coming into Medicare as they turn 65. And uh, I think it, this is the right time uh, to look at reforms. Uh, one recent proposal was called the Medicare Essential proposal by Karen Davis and, and others in the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, they proposed to combine parts A, B, and D with a single deductible, co-payments, and a ceiling on out-of-pocket costs. In addition, it would build incentives for beneficiaries to choose the high-value care we've talked about this morning, including uh, in having them join those primary care practices that qualify as patient-centered medical homes and using providers participating in alternative payment models like ACOs. I've seen some of these in Florida where they're, they're very intensive. They are, uh, the nurses are on the line constantly with their patients talking about smoking cessation, 
taking their medications, but it's still uh, very difficult. And an inherent part of that proposal is the assurance of equitable access for low-income beneficiaries. Dr. Newman, do you, what's, your, what's your view of that proposal? Do you have any criticisms, or do you want to highlight the good parts of it? Well, I think it's a proposal. Uh, you're looking at a lot of proposals that are uh, trying to achieve similar goals. This proposal is uh, certainly worth looking at, in particular the features that would provide the catastrophic protection, and to encourage uh, uh, people on Medicare to move towards systems where there are incentives to uh, improve the delivery of care. And I think there's a lot of interest in in um, giving beneficiaries access to the kinds of care coordinators, nurse practitioners, the kind of um, services that you were talking about that you've, you have seen, and that would be encouraged under this proposal. It has a relatively low limit on out-of-pocket spending. It has a fairly low deductible, so I think it recognizes the needs of people with modest income. So I would it, uh, encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, doctor. Do you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, I do think that it, there are a lot of common threads in these proposals where there's a, a consensus emerging that the protections that Medicare affords are vital and have to be preserved, but that moving patients towards programs that foster whole health that look across silos and are really engaged with patients to activate them and to ensure that they're consuming the care that's actually going to produce health for them with the highest value. There are a lot of common threads in these, and, and I'm optimistic. I don't know if okay. that's reasonable that Mr. we can Mel? move that way. Well, I looked at the, uh, the Part E proposal, which is somewhat of an update of an older one uh, a couple of months ago. I, I appreciate the creative use of the Medicare alphabet, but I think it's really aiming for Medicare Part U, universal, uh, while trying to squeeze out private competition, if you look at the actual underpinnings of it. And there are a number well, of- Well, that raises another, another point, because uh, I think the Medigap policies, the supplementals, I, I get your point about, are they encouraging overutilization? And it, they seem to be ripe for reform and cost savings, too. When you look at traditional Medicare, the administrative costs are only 2%. You look at those med Medigap policies, administrative costs are 20 percent. That's awfully high. Dr. Newman, what's, where should we be headed in reform of those supplemental policies? Well, the loss ratio requirements haven't been looked at uh, for some time, so that might be something you might want to look at with Medigap policies. I mean, the, 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 the issue with Medigap is um, it, it may drive up utilization and spending of Medicare services, but people really rely on Medigap for the security that it provides. People seem to want protection. They don't seem to want uh, to have an unpredictable, unaffordable medical, medical expense occur throughout the year. There are kind of two sets of proposals out there on supplemental insurance. One would prohibit first dollar coverage for Medigap. The other is a surcharge approach or a tax approach, would, which would tax both Medigap and employer-sponsored plans. And they would have very different effects for it, depending on how they're implemented. Thank you very much. I've run out of time. Chair, sure, thanks. General Lady, now I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. And perfect uh, trend. <laughs> my friend from Florida led right into my questions. I was going to talk about the Medigap. Uh, a lot of times we talk uh, transparency and pricing, and you can't find the pricing in healthcare. And I can tell you, if you go to the Houchins IGA grocery store in Bowling Green, Kentucky, there's a price on everything. Because if they didn't have a price on anything, nobody would buy anything because people, it, they, it's the, out of their pocket. But in fact, they got a sign tall enough you can see what their gallon of gas costs going down I-65 at 70 miles an hour. And so, so that's just the problem. We, we, but I, I would tell you this, if I paid $100 a month to Houchins IGA and they allowed me to come in and buy anything that I wanted to because I paid $100 a month, not only would prices go away, I probably wouldn't make too intelligent of, of at least value base. I would buy the T-bone steak every time I went in. And, and, and so the question, there was a 2009 MedPAC study. I think we just started getting into it about the beneficiaries with first dollar coverage and they use uh, the system about a third or they have a third higher medical costs than those with no supplemental and first dollar coverage regardless of type of the plan results in higher medicare spending and in june of uh, the june study medpac made some recommend in june they made some recommendations to address this i think we talked about uh one is a copay a fixed dollar copay and the excise tax that you talked about um the excise tax, I, I, don't, I have some concerns with it. One is that if, if I, say, I pay $100 a month for it, and all of a sudden they say, well, you're going to have to pay a tax, so you're going to pay 110 
well, that ten dollars will go into the trust fund. I get it to help offset my costs, but it doesn't change my behavior at all. So I mean, it just, that just doesn't seem to, other than putting money in the system, doesn't seem to have any change in me using a third more. I think it might have an effect. Uh, the effect might be different for people with lower incomes. So for people who can afford the extra ten dollars in your example. Um, they pay the $10 and they keep their coverage and life goes on and they use services as they did. For people who can't afford the $10, they probably give up their supplemental coverage or they may give up their supplemental coverage and then they would face the true costs of whatever services they used. And so the tax would have a negative impact on the poor. Then the excise tax would have a neg negative impact on the poorer recipient. So it would price people out. It could price people out of the market is what you're saying. That's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess I would like to talk just a, okay. just a discussion since I've got a couple two and a half minutes of this whole first dollar coverage and and what you think should change that and change that and then start. I think Mr. Miller is about to start. So. Well, I was just going to add in in the Medigap area, we already have plenty of evidence that people buy plans that cost more than a dollar for a dollar in benefits. So we can go through the you know approach of taxing them a little bit more and making them even less of a good deal. I suspect we'll still have some people buying it. But the 2009 study was very well crafted because there's been a lot of older evidence on the e extra costs that are thrown off by supplemental coverage. I think it dealt with some of the criticisms of the earlier work and made it quite clear that more so for individual Medigap purchased insurance less so for employer-sponsored insurance, but all of them have a higher cost impact on Medicare, and that's not co covered by the Medigap premium or the employer cost. It's passed on to every other Medicare beneficiary. But it continues to add into that I don't have to price my health care because it's being covered from first dollar coverage. I, and, Dr. Right. And, and in general, when you tax things, people consume less of them. And the goal, I think, would be to reform the basic Medicare benefits so that people had the vital financial protections and didn't need the Medigap policies as much. And then pricing the Medigap policies differently would take into account the extra costs they impose on Medicare and other Medicare beneficiaries and would hopefully uh, induce people to move towards plans that didn't have so much first dollar coverage because they were getting their out-of-pocket protections from the main Medicare program. They would then scale back the consumption of care that's of less value and everybody's care would be a little more affordable. There are a lot of steps in that chain. Right. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how big each of those steps would be. But we know that Medigap policies today are priced much lower than their true cost. And so we're subsidizing the kind of care that produces very little health. And that doesn't seem like a great way to continue. Okay. Any further discussion on Dr. Newman? Any other points on? Well, we're subsidizing, some, some of what we're subsidizing probably produces good health, but some of it may not. So th there's, a, there's a mix there. But there is a, there is a desire in this. We have to recognize that people want to insure themselves against, I just don't want to have to face this. I'd rather pay a little bit each month and not have to face it. I mean, many people in Medicare government. are living on fixed income, so they don't exactly. like the idea. So, so there's a good benefit. And I it. think the, the issue here is in a benefit redesign, if the deductible is relatively high and the out-of-pocket limit is relatively high because of budget constraints, then it may not dampen the demand for supplemental coverage if people still, feel, still will feel exposed to a high deductible and they can't afford to get to that limit. I think I just ran out of time. I appreciate it. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome to the... Uh, panel this morning. Dr. Newman, I really appreciate your testimony, especially your focus on economic circumstances and health status of Medicare beneficiaries and our need to be mindful of the, both the intended and unintended consequences of benefit design. Um, broad cross-sharing requirements would have a significant impact, as we've said, on low-income seniors. I wor worry that even with an attempt to build in low-income subsidies, this could still create barriers to necessary health care for vulnerable seniors and worsen health disparities that already exist. Um, could you comment on that further beyond what you brought You raise a good point. There are enormous disparities in income and assets of seniors by race and ethnicity. So people of color would um, be negatively affected by an increase in cost sharing unless there were adequate protections. Um, that, that's a real, that is a real issue. And 
we've heard a lot this morning, of course, because the focus is on Medicare today, but uh, Medicaid is also an important program for millions of seniors and benefit design could affect that. Could you talk about the role Medicaid plays for these low-income individuals and why it's so important? Yes, Medicaid plays um, an enormous role in providing financial security for people with very low incomes and very modest assets. So today, Medicaid uh, fills in the, the gaps, uh, helps to with cost sharing, helps with premiums, provides other benefits, but not all low-income people qualify and are covered by Medicaid. Right. So for those who are just above the Medicaid eligibility le level, they are responsible for their full cost sharing obligations and premiums and uncovered services as everyone else is and may or may not be able to afford supplemental coverage. Right. And um, just uh, take off from that, some people have proposed limiting the right. amount of federal, the federal government pays for beneficiaries either through a cap or per person payments or a cap on total federal spending. How might such a proposal affect coverage for and access to care for these vulnerable populations? I, mean, I, th I, I think it would shift the risk from the federal government to, or state governments to uh, the Medicare population and the poorest on Medicare. Yeah. I, um, this is, I'm just curious, as a physician who took care of Medicare patients, uh, a lot of comments have been made about the increased costs when there's, the, the, there's not significant cost sharing. In my experience, Medicare did not pay for unnecessary care. So um, <laughs> is it a guarantee that just having the um, no cost sharing increases the cost? Because if it, it might increase visits, but if Medicare doesn't pay for visits that are unnecessary, tests that are unnecessary, and anyone can respond. I'm just curious, because I've had blood tests, I've had things denied reimbursement. So I, I think you're highlighting that the black and white nature of necessary versus unnecessary is much messier in the real world. There's a continuum of value that care produces from urgent life-saving care to care that I do think is unnecessary or even potentially harmful. If you look at the example of uh, testing for prostate cancer in older men, Medicare pays for that, and there's an age so beyond which the test actually can do more harm than good because the can it's detecting cancers that would not actually kill the person, and it subjects the patient to downstream procedures and costs that may actually do them harm. And Medicare does pay for that. At the same time, it makes mistakes in not paying for stuff that is valuable. So I think there are both types of mistakes in the current program, paying for stuff it shouldn't and not paying for stuff it should. Well, I also think uh, on that prostate issue that um, we, we probably need some more research done and information, but providers can make judgments at, even at an older age with a person that has a, a positive uh, or a high <laughs> PSA. Um, I, I'm going to yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady, and now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Billerock, is five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much, and I thank you for your testimony. Uh, the question is for uh, Mr. Miller, first question. In your, in your testimony, you talk about the various ideas of structuring benefits with different cost shares and deductibles. Is it worthwhile to have multiple Medicare plans in the marketplace? First question, uh, we, w we could establish an actuarial value uh, and allow various plans of different premiums, uh, deductibles, and cost shares. This would allow seniors to choose a plan that fits their lifestyle and health status rather than a one-size-fits-all plan. Uh, it's correct that there's more than one way to configure insurance benefits, and, and certainly seniors should look forward to that. I think what you're hinting at is a better structured version of the current competition we have between fee-for-service Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans and a premium support model, which could provide that type of more vibrant competition. You have to have a starting point, though. How is the, the basic benefit defined legally from which then plans can vary in terms of how they re meet a actuarial equivalent of that or charge a supplemental premium for people who want more coverage than what that basic one is, is, is how the, the, the bids are, are determined. Uh, there's a harder 
question as to whether or not we can allow the Medicare fee-for-service program to offer more than one version. People are a little resistant to that. Uh, but if that enhanced Medicare fee-for-service with other benefits is not subsidized, where it's actually charging an extra premium, which people have to pay the cost of it, then that would be a, the type of level playing field competition, which we always talk about in theory, but never deliver in practice. Thank you. Uh, next question for all. I know we've touched on a lot of these issues, but I want you to give you an opportunity to elaborate a little bit. Uh, this one has to do with transparency. One of the great challenges of health care is the issue of price uh, transparency. Health care is perhaps one of the biggest sectors of our economy where no one really knows the cost of service. I go to the doctor. I pay copay. I know what the cost of that visit is before I go. I go to the doctor, I pay a co-insurance. I don't know what the visit will cost me until after the visit. Uh, when designing a new benefit structure, how can we increase the level of transparency in the system so beneficiaries can know what their costs will be before they even visit the doctor? And that's the question for the entire panel. So this is something beneficiaries complain about rightfully a lot, that they have no idea how much a service costs. And physicians aren't really in the business of giving them that information either. And so one model is to go to co-payments where you know $10, $20, it's known ahead of time. Another model is to make sure that the prices are easily knowable to the patients beforehand so they can make informed decisions and so their providers can help them too. If the providers don't know how much something costs, how can they make recommendations that are in their patient's best interest? How do you suggest we do that? Well, there, there could be a requirement that prices are transparent, and that's going to depend on what insurance product the patient has and what's been negotiated between the insurer and their pro the provider. There could be a move towards copayments instead of coinsurance. Either one could achieve <laughs> similar ends in terms of transparency, but would have different effects, I think, on the negotiations between insurers and providers, not in the case of fee-for-service Medicare, of course. Okay, Dr. Newman? Well, I would just say it's less of an issue with fee-for-service Medicare than it is in the commercial market for, for the rest of us who are out there going and wondering what the price of our uh, various services are. Um, I think co-payments would be a lot easier for people in Medicare to understand. It's what a lot of the Medicare Advantage plans are doing now. And I think it would just be um, um, easier to anticipate, well, if I go to the emergency room versus go to, go to my doctor, I'm going to pay this much more, so I better... You know, tr I should try to wait and see my doctor. If you, wa if you want beneficiaries to know the real cost of the care, co-payments are somewhat, you know, sometimes well, sometimes arbitrarily assigned, and they tend to converge in certain clusters. If you go to a co-insurance approach, if you know the co-insurance rate and it tends to be uniform, you automatically know what the full cost of the, uh, the, the covered service was. It's just a simple matter of multiplication. So you both see what you're paying, and you know what the all-in cost was that other people are picking up. Very good. Uh, Mr. Miller, traditional Medicare fee for service operates in two different silos, uh, Part A, of course, and Part B, without either part talking to each other. Uh, Medicare Advantage provides a comprehensive benefit with better coordination between the hospital and the outpatient settings. Do we have data evaluating Medicare Advantage against traditional fee for service? Does Medicare Advantage provide lower costs and better outcomes compared to the traditional fee, fee for service? We have some studies which, if you look at certain areas, will say they're more effective in what they do. I don't think there's a comprehensive evaluation which can do a, you know, apples to apples uh, across the board uh, evaluation of that because the programs operate so different. In addition, although we've changed some of the rules uh, for the, uh, the way the bids are uh, set up and how they're reimbursed, we've not had them operating on the same level playing field entirely. So for a period of time, we paid more to the Medicare Advantage plans in order to bring in more services and more enrollees. Now that's being pulled back. We're not exactly at a total equivalence to, to make an all-in comparison. What lessons have we learned from uh, Medicare Advantage, the entire panel, if we redesign uh, traditional Medicare? So I think Medicare Advantage has uh, evidence of better coordinated care, although not uniformly lower costs. I do think there's the potential that when Medicare Advantage promotes best practices and higher value care, that can have system level consequences because the same hospitals and the same providers treat MA patients and traditional Medicare patients. So if they improve their efficiency for a critical mass of patients, that can have system level ramifications. And we see some evidence of those spillovers. 
Dr. Newman. Uh, we, in a recent review of the literature, we have found that there's sort of mixed evidence, and the evidence is pretty early. So um, there is some evidence of some positive outcomes and uh, indicators from M Medicare Advantage plans, but not all Medicare Advantage plans are alike. And so I think it will be important to see um, what constitutes a, an effective uh, plan and what, what produces positive outcomes, and I think we don't quite know yet. Mr. Miller, what lessons have we learned? We've learned that it's pretty hard to do this, uh, particularly through political means. Uh, and I think the lesson we should take is perhaps if we can get it out of Washington into the hands of doctors and, and, and patients, we might actually begin to sort this out and find a better balance. Very good. Gentleman's time's expired. Thank you. Thank Chair, you. recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to shift away, and we've been talking about sort of in the context of the Medigap policies and so forth, about um, what you do um, to address overutilization of procedures and services that may not be as necessary as others on the continuum. I wanted to go to the other side of the spectrum and talk about how reimbursement methodology and the benefit structures um, can, can address underutilization of services, particularly on the preventive side, uh, that we'd like to see patients take up more. And we've seen some reforms that have gotten a lot of attention in the last year or two. Annual wellness visits now are covered without a copayment, so there's no out-of-pocket expense for the patient, certain kinds of screenings, mammography screening, colonoscopy, and so forth. But I wondered if you could just, you know, all the panelists could just speak to that, that end of the spectrum and some of the innovations you see that really go to this goal of empowering patients to be full partners in their care, which is really talking about how do you boost up the, the preventive ownership that they have. And also speak to not just the services that get provided that are uh, preventive services, let's say, but some of the new technologies that are being made available that patients can use to, to better manage their own care on the prevention side and what, what sort of coverage and benefits do you see coming into the picture there? That's a, a big and important topic and I, th I think you're, I agree with you that sure, payments can influence underutilization. Some services are underutilized because they're under reimbursed, but there's a whole world of other behavioral factors beyond payments that affect patient engagement and adherence and management of their diseases. And innovation and provision of those preventive services can range from, you know, their, their medicine bottles that now can radio whether the bottle has been opened or not so that there can be external monitoring and promotion of adherence you know whether the patient's actually taken the pill. There are um, you know, visiting professionals, nurses, other healthcare providers who can help coordinate care in the home for patients who have trouble getting out of the home or coordinate patient groups. And I think all of those mechanisms for investment in wellness have potential long-term really big positive implications. And the reason we see employers getting involved is that people often have a longer-term relationship with their employer than they do with their insurer, and they spend eight-plus hours a day in the workplace, and that's a great site to promote that kind of investment. I'm going to talk about prevention in a different sense for an older, frailer population. So there are delivery system reforms being tested now. For example, the independence at home demonstration, where physician and teams of professionals come into the home with the idea of engaging the patient and family members to prevent patients from going, needing to go to the emergency room or having to go to the hospital. And they employ technology in the home that can help the, the medical team and the social, support, social services support team monitor what's going on in the home in order to provide care in the most appropriate setting, which in this case is also the lowest cost setting and what patients and their families prefer. So through technology and through a tested intervention of providing team-based care in a home setting, Medicare is exploring the idea of providing better care to people in the most appropriate setting using new technologies and electronic medical records to manage patients better. Since we got a little more time, um, 
I've run in recently, I've run into a number of um, uh, pharmacists and they've sort of raised this issue of how reimbursement works uh, for their, uh, s the services that they assert they're providing that are, that are not covered at all. And that's an example of, of um, you know, frontline interaction with patients that can make a huge difference and, and a lot of patients are very dependent on the pharmacist for giving them, you know, some guidance. Can you talk about whether there's any look at sort of what the benefit structure and reimbursement is in that arena? So without speaking specifically to pharmacists, I don't know yeah. as much about that uh, issue as I'd like to. I think having bigger teams of caregivers from doctor to nurse to pharmacist to home visitation would promote looking at sort of the whole patient and disease management is not about any of those silos. And the siloed reimbursement that we do that under reimburses some and over reimburses others really discourages the team-based approach to being responsible for a group of patients' outcomes among a group of providers that would give some more flexibility to say, you know, here's who would really help this patient. It's this kind of provider. Let's put more resources towards that and let's take resources away from this type of patient. Thanks very much. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the Chair Emeritus, the full committee, Mr. Barton. Five minutes for questions. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions. I'll be happy to yield my time to anybody who wishes it. Mr. Lance. Uh, thank you and good morning to you all. It's a very interesting panel, a um, very important issue. <clears throat> um, some raise concerns about the uh, escalating costs of new medical treatments in the context of the nation's growing entitlement program costs, and we're all concerned about that, obviously. Uh, Dr. Baker, you note in your testimony that technological innovation uh, raise the, raises the stakes in, in, in this debate. There are different ideological approaches to controlling costs, especially those associated with new treatments. Um, uh, some choose to develop a framework in the health care reform law whereby the government would choose value rather than the consumer or the patient by implementing the governmentally driven model such as IPAB. And of course, IPAB is something that I oppose and many oppose on a bipartisan basis, particularly here in the House. Um, uh, could you speak to the value of a cost-sharing framework where Medicare enrollees would choose services and treatments if they were spending their own funds? I, I agree that, that the rise in cost raises the stakes in that there are new treatments all the time that could provide really valuable benefits, and there are new ways to spend money that might not provide high health value. And if we were to cover every possible service that might benefit every possible beneficiary even a little bit with public funds because of innovation that could be more than 100 percent of gdp so there has to be some way to allocate those resources and i would argue that the more flexible that is the more patients have some choices about the bundle of care that's right for them i think we can't afford to be subsidizing the use of low value care for high income beneficiaries but it's very hard to write down a set of rules that says this is the type of service that's worth it and this isn't uh, thank you. Would anyone else on the panel like to uh, comment? Dr. Newman. Well, I would just say it's so hard for patients to make these decisions, particularly when they're sick and they're scared. Um, you know, you think of somebody who's just been diagnosed with some form of cancer, and they go to their doctor, and their doctor says, there are three treatment options for you, and I think you should do this one because I'm the expert. And he, the doctor rarely says, and that one's going to be the more expensive one, and it's a new technology, and all that other stuff. When you are scared, you go to the expert, and you're rarely thinking about what's the cost to me. I really want to live and survive this disease. What, uh, Thank you. Mr. Miller. What, what we're struggling about is a decision between uh, the, the, the locus of decision making and changing the degree to which uh, it, it currently resides. I think the better way to go is to be a uh, approach toward more delegated but informed decision making uh, with greater involvement, not maximum involvement, not unrealistic at the uh, beneficiary and consumer level. We need to remember that seniors are allowed to manage the rest of their budgets without Washington telling them what is high value and low value. Yes. They have other income that they have to spend on other things. And we don't say, here's what your benefit structure is for your food, your housing, uh, the other things you're going to spend on. Now, that can be driven to unrealistic levels, and that's why 
why we have the protections for low-income seniors. The other thing to remember is that the default option often is not to do the most uh, high-level, perfectly calibrated value judgments in what we cover. Instead, what we do, and this is the Affordable Care Act, is we re reduce reimbursement across the board and pretend that we haven't taken away anyone's benefits when we've actually hollowed them out by doing it through the, the pass-through of paying providers less. I, I thank you. Um, uh, let me say that I hope as we uh, move forward we might review uh, some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Obviously, I did not support it, but moving forward, I hope that we have the opportunity to review, uh, for example, IPAB. And I, I believe, based on my observation, that there is a bipartisan consensus, particularly here in the House, that we should revisit that issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding here and, uh, and thank our witnesses for appearing. We hear a lot from my colleagues on the Republican side. There needs to be most co more cost sharing in Medicare program. Cost sharing makes sense, making sure beneficiaries have skin in the game in good policy. That's why we already do it. Seniors spend a lifetime of working to pay into the system. Once beneficiaries are eligible, they rack up thousands of dollars in bills due to cost sharing. If we continue to decrease the portion paid by the government, more and more future retirees will be unable to pay their bills. With the system remaining solvent in 2026, I, we have the time to make sure we can do it right. Benefit redesign and more cost shifting in the beneficiaries become necessary, but the devil's in the details. For instance, we should look at a value-based system in a system where higher value procedures, the government should be willing to pay more for lower value procedures, the beneficiaries should pay more. At the same time, we should focus on strengthening preventative care and improving outcome, quality outcomes, which save money now and later. Cost sharing and benefit redesign cannot happen alone. It must be done carefully. And out-of-pocket expenses must be predictable and necessary health care must be high quality and low cost. Dr. Newman, is it necessary to approach cost sharing and benefit redesign with nuance? And can you explain your, in your testimony about the incentivizing the adoption of high value care and what kind of care would be high value? For reasons which you just described, I think it's very important to approach this with nuance. I think we have all three of us talked about um, the importance of uh, maintaining and improving protections for people with low and low and modest incomes, and trying to make um, uh, adding catastrophic protection. But um, the moving together the pieces in between is complicated without shifting costs onto certain people. Uh, there's there seems to be a great deal of interest in moving people toward high value care. But deciding what is high value is remains a challenge. Um, so I, I think I would imagine we'd all agree that there are a lot of points of agreement, including we should move very carefully given the importance of this program and the protections it provides. Uh, and I do think there's some, even the private sector is moving to that. Uh, there was an article just recently about companies, uh, you know, employers coming together and saying, in California, this is the, these are the standard prices, and this is what we will pay. Now, if you want a higher value, you're on your own. It's out of network, so, uh, so to speak. So that maybe the market's actually doing that, but it would help the market if we use Medicare, because that's our national health care, to be able to talk about it. Well, you know, I think it can go both ways. There are times when the market follows Medicare, and this could be a time where Medicare follows the market and learns from the best practices that are already taking place. We find that uh, private plans and private markets, because they have to meet a bottom line, they have to satisfy their enrollees, they're in business every day competing with other people, they have to find that high value. They're motivated to do it. It's a lot harder for us in our system to do this politically. The idea that you're going to be voting every year in Congress on, well, what's the latest set of high value calculations uh, is not realistic. In the same way, delegating it to, well, somewhere in HHS and CMS, they'll figure it out and we'll all be happy about that. Again, it kind of transcends the bounds of what we've normally seen in the past. Well, and I agree, and we know when we, uh, a lot of us have a change in how medicine is practiced as something we've always, everybody says, oh, that's not the way it should be, and, and uh, we're always second guessing. Um, Dr. Newman, how has the Affordable Care Act added value to Medicare? Well, in a number of ways. Um, I think w one of the clearest ways that it has helped to slow the growth in Medicare spending, so it will keep Medicare around for future generations. It will help to sustain the program for longer. 
and that's probably not something that has gotten a whole lot of attention. I think also it is putting in place delivery system reforms to be tested, which could have a fundamental effect on the future of the delivery of care for future generations, maybe current generations, but the future generations of Medicare beneficiaries. There are maybe dozens of delivery system reforms that are being tested. Maybe all of them will not work, but to the extent that any of them are going to improve care, co better coordinate care, that will make a fundamental shift. Well, and I think, uh, I know I only have 29 seconds, but uh, the medical home issue. Medical uh, home is a good example. Um, uh, there are a number of them. That would help. And, um, and also looking at the, the preventative care, um, and it just makes so much sense that if you're diabetic, to have these annual Medicare exams to make sure. Uh, we know also the lower your income, the less you're likely to go if it costs you money. Exactly, so and, of, and of course you. there's the infamous donut hole, which creates enormous problems for people if they have those high expenses, which will now be closed as a result of the Affordable Care Act. It's closing slower than I would like, but it's closing. I yield back my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, five minutes for questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me first say, that I would like to see a Medicare benefit structure that protects beneficiaries from catastrophic expenses, um, encourages the use of high-value services, and strengthens the financial protection for low-income beneficiaries. And having voted against the Ryan budget for the last three years, I will not support proposals that seek to cut Medicare benefits or dramatically increase vulnerable beneficiary, vulnerable beneficiaries out of pocket costs for vital health care services. Uh, as we try to transform the health care system, the one that promotes prevention and early intervention, I worry, very much worry, that proposals that include higher deductibles and co-payments could be a hindrance to this effort. So, Dr. Baker, I like the example you gave earlier with diabetics. I feel uh, both the human and cost implications if higher cost sharing for a doctor's office visit resulted in, for example, a diabetic foregoing regular blood sugar monitoring and that eventually resulting in an expensive hospitalization and debilitating health uh, care requirements. So let me ask you, Dr. Baker, and also Dr. Newman, can you elaborate on how increased cost sharing might have a negative impact on treatment adherence? Yes, I think it's important that cost sharing be nuanced, as we've all said, and not crude. And just in increasing cost sharing could drive people to forego care that has long-run payoffs, and we want to avoid that. That said, there's a lot of care that has really questionable health benefit that I think our system can't afford to subsidize. So the question is, can we lower the subsidies or increase the cost sharing or prices for care that doesn't produce that downstream benefit and use those resources to shore up services that have really high value, particularly for low-income beneficiaries. And I think it's hard to write down a set of rules that says this yes, this no, this yes, this no. But I very much agree with your question that we need to subsidize that kind of care so that people don't forego things that would improve their health. Thank you. Dr. Newman, do you agree? Uh, well, so, yes, I do agree. I mean, a very good example is a home, the home health copay or coinsurance, which people have talked about because Medicare does not apply uh, co-payment or co-insurance to these services. So a home health, who uses home health services? This is older, frailer women. Um, many have, got, have been to the hospital and are out. So a co-insurance would affect people who have very long, a long number, many, many visits, and it would probably discourage a lot of visits. Um, some of them may or may not be necessary, but they are visits that have been ordered by a medical professional. So it would clearly either shift costs onto the oldest and frailest and or reduce utilization. And uh, some people think that's a good idea, uh, but there are risks to doing something like that. I mean, uh, the alternative approach is to think about ways of creating incentives for the providers of care so to provide appropriate care so that people don't get too much of what they don't need, but they get what they do. Thank you. I, I know that studies have looked on the impact of younger populations, but I want to ask both of you, do either of, of you know if studies have uh, specifically, specifically looked at the impact increased cost sharing might have on rates of hospitalization with older and sicker populations like those served by Medicare? 
there is one study that, I, that comes to mind immediately that looked at increasing the cost sharing for pharmaceuticals for a Medicare population that had wraparound coverage in California. And when you increase their copayments for drugs, they took fewer of them, but that was partially then offset by increased hospitalizations downstream. Mm -hmm. And that increase in hospitalizations was concentrated among people who had multiple chronic conditions. The, it didn't completely offset the cost savings for the, the reduction in pharmaceutical use, but those benefits accrued to different people because there were different insurers involved. So it's a great example of spillovers across sites and the importance of unifying insurance and care. Thank you. Dr. Newman, um, I agree with the, your written testimony, the statement in your written testimony that Medicare's current benefit design is complicated. And for seniors living on fixed incomes, it can be really difficult for them to accurately budget for health care costs given the various deductibles, premiums, copayments, and coinsurance rates in Medicare. Uh, on May 2013, just a couple uh, months ago, uh, analysis by your organization, the Kaiser Family Foundation, found that 18 percent of seniors in my home state of New York are living in poverty under the supplemental poverty measure, and they just simply uh, cannot afford uh, to pay more. So as we look at benefit redesign, can you elaborate on the benefit you see to replacing coinsurance rates with copayments? Sure. The, uh, the supplemental insurance measure is higher because it takes into account health expenses. And so when you think about so that is what people are incurring, which, which produces larger estimates of seniors in poverty. Co-payments um, can be structured so that they are less onerous. So a great example is back to the home health case we just gave. A co-insurance be, could be a, uh, an insurance on every visit, which would build up and up and up over time. An alternative would be a co-payment on an episode of care which would be fixed, more predictable, and wouldn't penalize those who have extensive need for home health services. And let me ask you a final question. Thank you. Um, either one, uh, MedPAC's 2012 recommendations on benefit redesign included the recommendation that the Secretary of Health and Human Services have the authority to make value-based changes to Medicare's benefit design. So can you describe what this might look like with a real-world example and why this would be of value in our rapidly changing health care system? Sure. So, so home health, I think, is an interesting example because it's a really important benefit for m millions of people, but it has been subject to some fairly well-publicized overuse, uh, potentially even abuse, of extreme rates of utilization for populations where it might not have such a high benefit. If there were more careful uh, delineation of the cases in which it actually benefited people and they were protected from copayments or had reduced copayments for those cases versus patients where there are lots of alternatives that might do just as well for them and where the utilization is less warranted, you could then ensure that this vital benefit for some is protected by cutting back on overuse in other circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Um, that concludes the questions of the members who are present. I'm sure there will be more questions from members uh, who are not here, and uh, we'll ask them to uh, give, s submit those. We'll submit those to you in writing, and we ask the witnesses to please respond promptly. Uh, and I remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, so they should submit their questions by the close of business on Friday, July 12th. We have a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I ask unanimous consent to um, include in the record the AARP testimony that was given at Ways and Means um, on the issue of benefit uh, restructuring. Without objection, so ordered. Um, very, very informational. Thank you very much for your testimony today. And without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.